Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Richard Stevenson. I'm the director of Stevenson Dental Solutions and we're going to talk about the PFM on a maxillary molar. Let's take a look at the armamentaria required for this particular preparation. First of all, the burr block. I love this SDS burr block because it's got every burr you'd want to use for all preparations, whether they be all ceramic, PFM, metal crowns, gold onlays, ceramic onlays. The back row is primarily dedicated to indirect restorations where the front row is for direct. The burrs we're going to use today are the 847KR016 which measures 1.6 millimeters at its widest point. The finishing version of that which is a 30 micron grit diamond. The 878K for our axial walls, the 859010 for the inner proximals. We can use the end cutting and then we can use these little chamfer type burrs here for most of the lingual chamfer and some of the inner proximal. We're going to start the preparation off today with occlusal reduction and that would be the 847KR016. Let's get started. You know occlusal reduction is probably the most important aspect of just about any indirect restoration because uh, we as dentists have a tendency to be so conservative. We need to use predetermined ways to measure how much we're reducing and in this particular case I'm using the reduction plane technique. This is a technique that I've devised over the years because it leaves the tooth in a more finished state at the conclusion of the occlusal reduction rather than having depth grooves which oftentimes leave the surface very irregular requiring a lot of extra finishing and, and tend to lead to over reduction or just by uh, eyeballing the reduction uh, and being under reduced. This technique utilizes making these little distinct planes and here's one of four that will go across the facial that can be measured by looking at the end of the burr and how it relates to the unprepared tooth structure and it's a very predictable technique to obtain accurate, adequate, appropriate occlusal reduction and occlusal clearance. You can see I'm using the burr here to focus on one plane at a time and not moving the burr all over the tooth uh, haphazardly but just very precisely one plane and another plane. And then after performing the the planes you can utilize uh, if you have an instrument like an RGS-3, which measures one millimeter in diameter, you can use that RGS-3 to measure how much of a little ledge or wall that you've just created right along here. And you can see that it's more than one millimeter. If we use the RGS-4, which measures 1.5 millimeters, you can see that it's just about 1.5, and uh, that gives us a good idea of how much we've reduced already. We can follow the same pattern uh, with the rest of the tooth. Now this is the non-functional re reduction. Uh, I refer to this as the C plane. And the B plane will be in between. Uh, that's the, the facial inclines of the lingual cusp. And then of course the A plane or the functional cusp bevel will be on the lingual side of the lingual cusp for this particular case. And the same philosophy, the same fundamentals can be applied to any PFM whether you're doing a premolar, a maxillary or mandibular molar or premolar. So it's a, it's a technique that basically involves a system, a systematic approach where each step is done the best you can and at the end hopefully you have a preparation that uh, not only meets but exceeds uh, your, your, your desires in, you know, in creating this conservative yet very neat uh, preparation. And you can see once again I'm working on plane after plane and there are four planes along this larger C plane. There are these four individual planes that follow the inclines that are created off of each of the triangular ridges. The burr is being uh, situated so that you're always paralleling the angulation of these and if you look from the side you can see that it creates a pretty nice uh, initial neat uh, reduction. Now uh, moving on to the functional cusp bevel or the A plane, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to reduce the A plane with the burr angled the same angulation we would have for the facial cusp. So we can measure it right there and then transfer it over. Uh, this video is in real time. This is uh, utilizing a brush stroke 
Uh, so we're just taking off a little bit of tooth at a time, but we're always coming back to a point of reference, like right there, where we know how much we're taking away. You can see we've completed most of this A-plane, most of this functional cusp bevel, and uh, doing so with almost a crescent shape. We're now going to take the burr and insert it through the distal lingual groove area to create the extension of the functional cusp bevel into the distal pit area and uh, right across that oblique ridge. So we're maintaining the morphology of the oblique ridge meeting up with the distal buccal cusp. And now let's get ready to do the B plane. When you're doing the B plane, uh, you want to angle the burr so that it par parallels the original incline. But go ahead, when you reduce this, keep in mind that when you're done, the cusp tips on the mesial lingual and the distal lingual are going to line up with your original location of the cusp tips before you even started. And this is a great way to make sure that you've done adequate reduction. You can see how the burr, as it's going across, I'm using the tip of the burr to make absolutely sure we are getting at least 1.5 millimeters of reduction because the uh, tip of the burr is about 1.2 and we're going a little bit deeper than the tip of the burr. When we finish the preparation we're going to perform some smoothing with the 8847 KR, the same burr that we're going to be using to finish the shoulder and we'll be removing that last little half a millimeter of tooth structure that is left behind uh, after we're done with the, the fundamental reduction. There's always some, some scratches and some irregularities that you like to remove at, at, the, at the end. And that's why we don't reduce two millimeters from the very start. We give ourselves a little bit of room for the finessing at the very end. And you can see that what I'm doing here is I'm really trying to maintain the oblique ridge. I'm not going to cut through it and flatten it. I'm going to have a definite step between the mesial lingual and the distal lingual. There will be about a one millimeter step just like there is in the natural tooth before we get started with this occlusal reduction. Whenever you're doing the reduction, you want to be careful to avoid hitting the adjacent inclines and creating little irregularities it just makes it a little harder to clean up at the end so you know take your time and make sure that the location of the burr is not gouging into an area of the tooth that you've just created you can definitely see that step between the mesolingual cusp and the distolingual cusp incline right there and that step should be there and you don't want to flatten that out and take it away it has to be part of your morphology when you're finished. This is an anatomical tooth reduction. This is not uh, following some arbitrary planes or some flat surface. Uh, this is respecting the original morphology of the tooth. When you're finished prepping this tooth, you could be uh, just a novice dental student and you'd still be able to cite all of the morphological features and be able to identify this as a max slave first molar. So, at this point, we have completed the, the basic occlusal reduction. You can see that the morphology is still there. And more importantly, what you want to check at this point is have you maintained the cusp tips in the right place? So I'm going to use a little pink marker here, and I'm just going to mark the cusp tips on the adjacent teeth, and then I'm going to mark the cusp tips, the, the lingual cusp tips, and see that they, they all line up in a nice arc form right there. It's, it's, it's great. It, this does not apply to the facial cusp. It's only for the lingual cusp. Axial reduction uh, starts off with a tapered diamond, and the diamond that we really like is the 878K012. Uh, we found this diamond to be very useful because it creates such a nice a uniform taper around the tooth. It could also be used to create a chamfer, although the tip of the burr is too small to create a chamfer that has enough depth to make it practical to make temporary crowns and, and crowns with enough reduction to uh, 
place porcelain over the metal. So we want to use this burr really just for reducing the axial walls. And you're going to hold the burr along the long axis of the tooth, which is tipping out towards the facial a little bit, and uh, reduce it so that you identify the approximate altitude or height location of the finish line relative to the tissue, but not so much the form of the finish line. In other words, we're not really at this point worried too much about the chamfer form. We're more worried about the chamfer location, and we're also trying to reduce enough axial tooth structure so that we have adequate space for the metal, the opaque layer, and the ceramic. Now we're going to assume that this is a default PFM. In other words, a PFM that utilizes a shoulder on the facial, a shoulder on the facial of just porcelain, and on the lingual, a two to three millimeter lingual collar. That would be Schillingberg's default uh, PFM restoration design and unless uh, you're trying to do something else that would be a good starting point. And notice how I'm stopping the bird just about as far as I can go in approximately without uh, hitting the adjacent tooth. I go about as far as I can with this bird. It's a little bit wide to just push this bird right through the interproximal. Uh, you can do it. I certainly uh, have done it before. Uh, but on these uh, really critical situations, particularly on type knot teeth, let's, let's be super careful. But there you can see that um, it does a really good job of creating a nice uh, taper and at least the starting uh, point for a chamfer margin. We're going to repeat the same process on the facial and uh, you're going to bring the, the burr around in approximately as far as you can. So the, ne the next step is, is simply just to take a very thin burr and cut through those two little portions that stick out interproximally. So let's work on interproximal clearance. Interproximal clearance is one of the more difficult steps of the preparation, particularly on the distal. And we're going to use the 859-010. This is a needle-shaped burr, and we're going to paint the burr through the interproximal step-by-step, step, starting at the base and working our way up, rather than trying to push the entire burr through the interproximal space, which is really tricky to do. We're going to paint the burr through gradually, sort of almost like going uphill. Do you see how the burr is sweeping upward as we're holding the handpiece very stable with our hands and we're really focused on not going too deep axially, over tapering, or being so careless as to hit the adjacent tooth. So those three things. You want to hold the burr straight up and down so that you avoid going too far axially, you don't over taper, and you don't hit the adjacent tooth. You can see the purpose of this step is merely to break contact. Don't concern yourself at all with the shape of the chamfer. Just think about breaking through that interproximal area because we're going to fix all these other things with the next step, which I refer to as axial reshaping. Axial reshaping will take us back to the burr we were using earlier, which is the 878K012. But this time, we're going to think about equalizing the taper all the way around the preparation. We're going to look at areas where we have little lumps and bumps and we're going to even those out. We're going to hold the burr very stable. Once again, we're going to keep the burr confined to that, that level at the, at the genital all the way around. You can see how that's working out really nicely right across here. We're, we're basically setting the stage for the chamfer generation, which will be in the subsequent step. So any area right now where you see you have an undercut, get rid of it. Any area where you see you have an irregularity, get rid of it. This is the time to correct these axial mistakes. Once you have all the axial walls in good condition, then we can start with the shoulder and the chamfer refinement. This is the using the burr sideways, which works great for removing little defects. There's uh, no law at all in uh, doing that. There's also a uh, uh, need sometimes to create a little bit of a secondary plane to your lingual reduction. Not the functional cusp bevel now. That would be uh, different. This is a secondary plane. You notice I have a mesobuckle undercut, and I've got to take care of that. So we can hold the burr and the right position right here and compare the bird to the adjacent teeth. It's really helpful. The adjacent teeth are giving you the clue as to how to hold the burr. 
And so often we forget to look at this, this particular view, this, this side view of our preparations. I found this view to be one of the most important views to visualize while we're preparing teeth for examinations or in the, in the clinical situation on the patient. So let's fix the chamfer. Uh, I like the chamfer already, but it's a little bit minimal. So we're going to pick up a, a bird called the 8877. You can also use the 877, which is more coarse if you want to work a little bit more rapidly. But I like uh, at this point switching over to a burr that is a uh, fine grit. This is only a 30 micron grit, and this is a Brasser burr. And Brasser uh, makes all the burrs in our system. And I've been working with Brasser for over 30 years, and I've I found their products to be uh, very, very good. There are other excellent burr companies out there. This just happens to be the company that I have been most familiar with. So uh, we go ahead and we can fix the functional cusp bevel, uh, reestablishing the crescent shape all the way back around to the zero point where it tapers to zero right there at the middle of the tooth and uh, make sure that everything is nice and even. We're not doing a lot of reduction here. We're doing mostly smoothing. This is gonna to contribute to that extra half millimeter of reduction that we talked about. We're gonna go over all these planes and just gently uh, resurface it a little bit. The tip of the burr uh, fits nicely into the groove areas too, so you don't uh, end up making uh, errors there as well. So it works incredibly uh, good for this particular step. We're gonna, round off any sharp edges. We don't want anything sharp underneath this uh, uh, restoration uh, preparation for uh, the PFM. It's got to have a nice rounded edges everywhere. And the burr works great for that as well. So uh, let's move on to uh, the, the concentrated effort of the shoulder. Uh, since we have the chamfer fixed, we are pretty happy with that. Let's turn our attention to the 8847KR016. You could use the 847, the same burr we used on the occlusal, but uh, I just find at this point, when you're finishing up the chamfer uh, and the shoulder, that we should stick with finishing burrs. It just tends to allow you to make a nice smooth finish line uh, in, in the most critical time. Where does the shoulder go? Well, it's on the mesial, it's going to go into the contact area. And on the distal, uh, it's going to the distal buccal line angle, distal facial line angle. You could carry it a little bit further in approximately on the distal if you had a high aesthetic demand patient. But most patients on the distal of a molar or distal of a second molar, it's fine to just take it over to the distal facial line angle. Uh, but on the mesial, it's a little bit uh, unsafe to do that because you'll end up showing some of the shoulder, uh, I'm sorry, the, the metal margin instead of the, the butt joint porcelain. So uh, we can just mark it here so you can kind of see where the shoulder is going to go. And uh, I went ahead, since I had the pencil in my hand, went ahead and marked the, uh, the rest of this internal line angle because I wanted you to see that there are no undercuts. And um, I'm laying the pencil down in that uh, internal edge there between the chamfer and the axial wall and carrying that all the way around so you can kind of see uh, whether you have an undercut or not. And, and when we hold it up like this, you can see that it's pretty good. Uh, Maybe a little bit of a tight draw on the, on the distal, but not bad. And if we need to make any alterations, we could. So let's remember, shoulder into the contact area in the mesial to the distal lingual or distal facial uh, uh, light angle. Here we have the 8847 and we're going to use once again a brush stroke and we're going to get a little bit of a purchase point and kind of grab that shoulder right there and then almost create a wing and uh, then I'm not really afraid how deep I go axially as long as I don't go any deeper than the width of the tip of the burr because that is going to be 1.2. So I'm going to be somewhere between 1 and 1.2 millimeters on our shoulder. 1.5 millimeter shoulders definitely work. Your lab will love you for that, but I can tell you that that's a lot of tooth structure to remove, and I would recommend against it, and I would try to stay in that 1 to 1.2 millimeter range. So we've got the shoulder essentially started there. You can hold the burr parallel to the root surface, and the tip of the burr should be uh, able to provide you the definition for that shoulder angulation. 
remember, a shoulder is defined by how it interacts with the root surface and not how it interacts with the axial wall. So shoulders could be uh, more than 90 degrees internally, could be more obtuse, but on the, the intersection, the angle that's formed between the shoulder and the unprepared root surface, that's the 90 degrees that would define uh, the shoulder. So can we lower it down a little bit more gingerly as we're doing this? Absolutely, uh, not a problem. Uh, while you're doing this though, you wanna be cognizant of the potential to create an undercut at that internal angle between the shoulder and the axial wall. You always have to be checking that area uh, because to make the shoulder perpendicular 90 degrees to the root surface, it has to tip away from the axial wall and uh, that could result in an undercut. You can see that the RGS3 is so helpful. It's one millimeter and it really gives you a great idea of the measurement of the, of the shoulder. You, you have no doubt that you've got the right shoulder removal. Now, I don't like wings. I like to transition them away. I like to take the, the chamfer and blend it through the wings and remove them. I like to put a little bevel on the shoulder interproximally and have this transition that goes from chamfer to shoulder bevel to shoulder. And that would be the, the natural way that you would want to do a PFM uh, preparation. So I think we're kind of close to the end where we're going to want to do some refinement. Hand instruments, slow speeds, more burrs can be used to refine this. Um, it's uh, a lot of fun to take your time and, and do what is necessary to make the preparation as smooth and neat as you can. Uh, look for any areas that you may have some rough spots and try to remove them. Uh, this is definitely not a perfect preparation. There are things that still need to be corrected, but it is definitely on the road to being uh, a very good preparation. The uh, corners there I just observed uh, were a little bit sharp, so we can round those off a little bit, and we can take little blips like that and smooth them off. It's just uh, kind of fun. When you know the, the prep is reduced enough, when you know you've got the right dimensions of the shoulder, when you don't have any undercuts, you have more time to finesse those details that can set your preparation apart from others and really give your laboratory something that they'll love to create a PFM for. And although PFMs are not done very often in clinical practice anymore with our all ceramic materials like zirconia and lithium disilicate, they still have a place in dentistry and they are still a very serviceable, uh, long lasting restoration. I think it's something that all dentists should continue to know how to do. And uh, I think that's why uh, we made this video is so that you can uh, understand the fundamentals of the standard PFM preparation for a molar. And when you look at it from the side, it should follow the contours. We should have 1.5 to 2 millimeters of clearance. I'm checking with a 1.5 millimeter wide RGS4 and it fits easily. So we know we've got adequate space for metal and for opaque and for the porcelain material itself. Uh, the preparation is done for today. And I want to thank you for your attention. If you want more information about more preparations, take a look at our website. We've got a lot of stuff up there. And all the burrs and tools we've shown today are absolutely uh, available online on our website. Have a good day.